It's Nature Winds Podcast, a climate adaptation journey. I'm your host, Maureen Aylward. This is Cape Ann's climate story, a storied place. Gloucester, Rockport, Essex, and Manchester by the sea. Coastal communities of people who know their way around a storm, but were vulnerable to climate threats and working on coastal resilience. On this episode of Nature Winds Podcast, we're looking at climate and the arts, and we're joined by two local artists. First, we're going to speak with Joanne Hart, the author of High Wire Act and Other Tales of Survival, a collection of short fiction from Black Lawrence Press, released in September of 2023. Her most recent book is Stanford 79, a true story of murder, corruption, race, and feminism in the 1970s. It's a crime memoir that weaves together the personal and public threads of a friend's death. Her novels are Float, a dark comedy about plastics in the ocean, and Adult, a social satire that intertwines animal rights with the politics of food. Her work, which also includes articles, essays, and drama, often explores the relationship between humans and their environments, natural or otherwise. In the second segment, I'll be joined by Kim Radosha, artist Kim Radosha's creations capture movement, and energy to immerse viewers in the moment. Her intense process of making, exploring materials, and connecting to place has led to inventive, vibrant artworks that convey fragility and strength. Highlights of Radosha's career include an invitation from the Cape Ann Museum to create a community sculpture for the opening of their sculpture garden in 2021. And that was entitled Heart in the Haystack. Kim has lectured throughout the country on creativity, art, and sculpture. Welcome to Nature Winds. I'm your host, Maureen Aylward. We're at the Streamography Studios today speaking to Joanne Hart, author first in our, in our segment, and then Kim Radoshia, um, who's an artist on Cape Ann as well, and she'll be with us in the second half. Um, before we get started, Joanne, I just wanted to say thank you to our sponsor, Common Crow. Um, uh, we're grateful for their sponsorship. Sure. Joanne, I, I was there today. You were there today? I, I'm there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we love Common Crow. Yeah, we do. Um, so, Joanne, you're mm-hmm. an award-winning author, mm-hmm. and uh, you've just published a book called High Wire Act. We're going to talk about that yeah. and also get into a little more conversation about your journey to climate and your writing. And, um, and also, we'll hear uh, an excerpt from your book. Great. So, Joanne... Um, I'm really interested in how climate change came to be part of your story. Mm-hmm. Like, what is that journey? What was that journey like? Where, where did it start to, you know, the intersection of writing and right. climate come in? Well, one, I mean, climate change is sort of the burning question of the day. It's like, I think it is basically, it's not just the top subject. Pretty much it's soon going to be the only one. Um, so, the, so specifically for me in my writing came... Oh, I don't know, 15 years ago when I started writing another novel called Float, which is a, a dark comedy about plastics in the ocean. And I didn't know it was going to be that. When I started writing, I just had a guy on a beach in front of a fish processing plant. And I started thinking about, like, what's on the beach? And, I, you know, seagull, sandbox. And then it was like, oh, and plastic. And then plastic became this major driving force in the book. And then because it's like a writer's always looking for a way to stop writing. So I would just stop and do like research because I just love research. I'd research, read all about plastics. Um, I think I hadn't really even known that it was, uh, they were made from fossil fuels. I mean, I think I knew that once in school a long time ago. So, um, you know, and then, you know, just the whole chain reaction of like, you know, the warming oceans and the plastic accelerants and you just, Everything about it just became then the book. And so that's the, it's not, I've always been quite aware of, uh, environmentally aware. I mean, the first Earth Day, I think I was, you know, like 12, a very impressionable 12. And I'm probably the only one in my household who turns off lights when she leaves the room and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, but as far as the writing goes, everything sort of changed with float when I realized everything. It, it, this really was the subject of, of that, and plus, plus animals. So 
Oh, there's also like yeah. a lot of animals everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. float I've, in this. I've yeah. got to ask about that in yeah. a little bit. Um, so, you know, writing is a process mm. that allows you to go in lots of different directions. Mm -hmm. And um, you're, you know, it, it in, in especially in the High Wire Act, there's, um, there are these uh, characters with intense depth um, that you, they can pick up and you can feel it right away. And, uh, and, and there's a, um, a, a cross, um, um, you know, way of, of how climate and death, loss mm -hmm. and grief and animals right. um, intersect, especially in High Wire Act. How, how do you come to creating that? Is it just, do these characters find you? Yes. Yeah, so these stories, these are all collected. Um, I probably wrote them uh, over a 15-year period. Um, every time in between uh, books, you know, you just sort of clear your head or you want to walk away from a novel you, or whatever, you just, yeah, I'd write a story. And so these have all been uh, written and published over 15 years, and so they were all at very different times. And uh, when it came time, when I... Uh, wanted to put together a collection. I, I have many more stories than this, but when it came to developing a collection, I sort of hit on the uh, theme of survival, and 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 the survival is so connected to climate change because it's mm -hmm. like, how and if are we going to survive? And you know, all living things, animals and humans, plants, everything is what right. it was. But so that's sort of the running theme of all the stories, even though they were all written far apart. It's like something that's always in my head. It's like, how, how, do, how do we survive? So tell me a little bit more about that. Is it, is it um, something that preoccupies you? Is it something mm -hmm. that you think about a lot? Because a writer is like visioning, you know, it's yeah. like futurism. You've, you're right. both looking in the present moment in your work, but also uh, looking to the extended future, you right. know, really far out. Yes. Um, so tell me more about how that, how that survival piece or mm -hmm. that relationship between climate and survival. Right. So I think it's like, it is something I think about all the time. Um, everything I buy or plant or do, I'm, I'm always thinking of the repercussions and the future. Um, I'm very concerned about my children's and my grandchildren's futures and like what we have done and left for them. It's, you know, like the sort of feeling like, how do I mitigate that in any way? Mm -hmm. And it is just something that's always on my mind. And so it just comes out in the story. And so, and so lately um, I have been doing speculative fiction and there are two examples of that in this collection, mm -hmm. um, meaning I am speculating on what the future will bring. Uh, if we do not change our ways, you know, if we don't start changing our human-caused climate change warming, what's going to happen? So I think a lot about that. I do, once again, so I don't have to write, I do research. Um, you know, I love science books. I really, um, a lot of these stories are very science-based. And um, so I then bring that to, you know, because reading the science sort of helps one comfort, soothe me, and alarms me at the same time. And so these are all things that, that show up in the stories. Uh, give us an example of one of the stories in the book and how you, you were doing some research. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there, uh, like, an example that you could provide to us that shows that connection mm -hmm. um, about how you went from the research to right. thinking about it to, you know, acting on it and writing about it. Right. So, well, the, the story, in fact, I'm going to read a couple of pages from uh, later. So just that one story I wrote in uh, 2016 or 17. It was actually uh, the only story I've ever written on commission. Um, I was invited to the Berlin Literature Festival as a basically part of their science program that they had read float it is was so science based their theme that year was oceans and the science and so i was part of the science cohort where they um so they so i was presenting float and they asked me to write a story for the festival and since it's europe you know i mean european countries are so Pro art and writing. I mean, they actually pay for this stuff. You know, they bring me there. They put me it's up. Great. They pay for the <laughs> stories. And um, 
so I and so I wrote the story. Um, I chose coral reefs, and then just did this enormous amount of research. What did you find about coral reefs? Well, they're dying. Mm-hmm. There's this thing called bleaching. Mm-hmm. Um, bleaching does not necessarily mean the death of a coral reef, but it's the first step towards death. Um, coral reefs are the nurseries of the world, of the oceans. Uh, if we get rid of the coral reefs as they die, there is no place for, uh, you know, for the regeneration of, of, you know, most of the species in the ocean. So it's ra- it's rather dire. Uh, polyps are, in fact, uh, polyps. Uh, co- coral is a living thing. It has polyps in it, and these polyps are the things that die. Uh, coral is not just this pretty rock. It is a living substance that, mm-hmm. that grows and is extremely sensitive to things like temperature. They have a narrow range. It's why you see coral reefs just so many feet away from land, so many feet, and then they stop. It's just this narrow range of temperature they mm-hmm. can be in, period. And, and they're an important um, species for protecting land as well. Oh, absolutely. As a breakwater. Oh, everything, yes. They keep the flooding and the, the you know, they absorb a lot like uh, wetlands. They're sort of the wetlands within mm. the oceans, and they yeah, keep the, the storm surges down as well. They um, we don't think of um, Gloucester as having coral reefs, you know, like yeah, the we Caribbean, don't. But yeah, but they are very much there. They're just not the pretty colors. We don't have that type of water, but uh, it's everywhere. So let's talk about your short story that you're mm-hmm. going to read yep. from. Um, it's Reef of Plagues. Yes, Reef of Plagues. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's not such a great picture of uh, an American tourist. Oh no, no, it's not. But. You know, I was writing for Europeans, you know. <laughs> but it brings home the, the um, you know, the lack of knowledge that people have. That's right. um, and, you know, the tour- tourism industry mm-hmm. um, and the impact that it can have on different um, environments, especially vulnerable yeah. environments. Mm-hmm. Um, any comments on that and the yeah. relationship between the one that you wrote? Yes. So, um, yes, I, you know, I didn't... It, I didn't mean for the American to be despicable, simply just, you know, ignorant as many tourists are about the environments in which they are entering. And, you know, they they think of, um, you know, coral reefs as an amusement park and uh, when and not even aware that they're living things and that there are that they need to be maintained and that there's certain sunscreens even that shouldn't be used and that you don't touch things. You don't walk away with the shells. You don't poke at the animals. I mean, there's, um, yeah, tourism is not a good thing for coral reefs, except in the small way in which it brings attention, pe- that people love them. Mm-hmm. And then you have to love something to save it. And so it Absolutely. helps that. But then leave it alone, you know? Then, yeah, leave then, it alone. Then leave it alone. <laughs> well, why don't you read from, from that passage okay. while we're on the subject? All right. Yes, and so this is... Um, the opening story. And I'll just read these two pages. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, these tourists are nothing but trouble, slapping and grinding through the water in their power cruisers, searching for a place to snorkel. Better luck milking a fish, we tell them, and they give us the rough side of their tongues. It was not so long ago we were adjusting their masks, leading them to where sapphire light once shone through branch cathedrals. The coral, luminous as jewels, our precious riches. Don't touch, we say again and again. This is not a treasure hunt. The reef is still the source of our living for those of us who are left, those who survived the first few seasons of sinking tourism. Who wants to visit a Hades of bleached bones? Hey, a bright pink man shouts from a vessel that has snuck up on us. Hey, we look at one another to see who's game. Our broad backs are to the sun, men and women alike, our bellies to the rubber boats as we scoop water samples into vials, scrape slime from lifeless coral, and take the reef's temperature as we would a dear child's. Out in deep water, buoys do all this and more, sending messages through the clear air and to the office computers. But the sensors can only monitor, not mourn it as we do. For years now, the coral has been fading like a shadow on the water, 
but no help came until the tourists themselves became endangered. The scientists do not discuss what will happen if the reef dies altogether, but we can read the signs. We know our fate. The pink man believes the problem is that we cannot hear him, so he inches closer, one eye keen on his depth finder. Electronics are not magic. It insults the gods to navigate a vessel like that in shallow water. Even we, in our inflatable dinghies, cannot always use our outboards and must pull with our oars. But that is not our job to tell him. Not anymore. So, um, you know, that, that whole story is about the relationship between the tourist mm -hmm. and the people who make their living. Um, are they researchers? The uh, they the are. Um, they're paid. Yes, they are paid um, to do this, that the scientists are, uh, don't always come out with them. And so these mm -hmm. are just the team that go out and collect the data every mm -hmm. day or a few times a day. Mm -hmm because they know the coral reef better than anybody. What was the response from the audience in Berlin? Oh, well, I don't know, because it was all in German, and my German was just, they, uh, it was just like, they actually translated it into German. And so, I mean, everybody was, like, looked, was applauding, was happy, but um, they, um, they actually put me with a scientist. I was paired with a scientist who spoke both German and English. Well, they all speak English, but the story was read in German. And and then he and I answered questions about the science in the story mm. afterwards. And he was some coral reef scientist. And and we and the Q and A was uh, back and forth in English and German. How are you finding in your other readings and some of the other places where you've been speaking mm -hmm. about um, your your collection? Yeah. Um, what is the what is the reaction? I mean, are, are you yeah. are you being paired with scientists? Are you? I you am know? often paired with scientists. Um, I it wasn't just Berlin. Um, I wrote a story that was published in Slate dot com last year. That was what it was like my first speculative one. And they paired it with an essay written by a scientist to talk about the science in there. So I've done panels on it. I've done a, a, a quite a few. And we talk about it always at every reading. There's um, a lot of talk about that. Um, I have a big following but I've been very young people who are very drawn to the dystopian speculative mm -hmm. things. Um, I had a story, oh, you know, actually it was Good Job Robin that's in here. One of the speculative stories was just republished in, in an anthology uh, for young queer people, you know, who are into uh, science fiction. Science fiction, queer science fiction is what that got published, mm -hmm. recently republished in. So that's the story with um, crickets. Crickets, right? Yes. And um, is that the one that has sort of this AI overboard? That's right. Yes. Uh, what, how did? Yeah. Yeah. How did you um, merge all those things together? Yes. So um, that I did. Um, I had learned a lot about AI, and this was before AI became this, you know, driving force this year. Um, AI need not be evil, and that certainly the that uh, Talos is not an evil presence. And it doesn't come across like no, that. No, it's not yeah. that. And in fact, uh, it's not like this really isn't like artificial intelligence as much as it is like community intelligence because they've just scanned all our books to, <laughs> and all our knowledge to to create it. And mm -hmm. then it's sort of sifted through. Create the answers. Yeah, that was a really fascinating one. I think, you know, addressing the insect uh, issue, both, right. um, you know, the the insect apocalypse, um, right. and also uh, uh, insects as food, yeah, and um, and harvesting, and yeah, that was a right. really uh, many cultures eat insects. insects. We don't, yeah, but that that's fairly common, and it's a high protein. Yeah, it's yeah. It, that's a fascinating one. You know, when I was reading the book, and I I really related mm -hmm. to your characters and the mm -hmm. stories, um, and at times I thought you were inside my head. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yay. Wait a minute. <laughs> and, you know, I, I I had that feeling of, you know, if I'm thinking about it, mm -hmm. other people are thinking about it mm -hmm. and just seeing it reflected, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of the urgency yeah. that is put forth in here, you know, the dangerous situations that people find themselves in, in your stories, you know, the focus yeah. on, um, you know, the grief aspect of, yes, of climate. It's, yeah, it's, it's huge, loss. right? Yeah. It's loss. 
It is. I mean, that's why, you know, it's these are, I never hadn't intended for all these stories to be dark, but in fact, there's just so much loss and grief surrounding climate change that it is, it just sort of permeates everything. You know, even the stories I think about are like happy uh, or hopeful. In fact, on but sometimes I'm caught like reading them aloud, reading them like, wait, wait, this isn't, <laughs> this is really, <laughs> should I be like, you know, reading aloud all this about suicide? I don't know. But, uh, but suicide it, it comes up again and again because that sort of is like what we're doing. You know, it's mm. a slow motion suicide and, um, and we're doing it consciously. Mm, yeah. And, and, you know, and, and dealing with this, um, you know, these issues of loss, uh, you know, I think mm. I'd like to definitely explore more of that. Um, I think it's a, something that we just don't talk enough about, right. the loss associated with um, That's the right. climate young, change. Young people feel it Young keenly. people are getting it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's a source of anxiety, of yeah. course, and uh, the existential crisis and that's right. urgency of climate change. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's one pe- there's there are two mm-hmm. uh, uh, um, stories, piece of history and live magical moments. Mm-hmm. And um, the live magical moments, it really struck me about kind of this overwhelm that the character has Mm -hmm. that continues through it. Like, what am I doing with this garden? Um, And how do I relate to it? And I'm overwhelmed. I just felt like that's how climate change is too. That's how, Mm -hmm. you know, taking the taking care of something and being given care. Right. Could you comment on that? Especially the connection for those. Yes. So, um, well, the connection between those two stories is because I had once written a whole series of stories based on real estate ads. And both of oh. those are real estate yeah. ads. They, they, they start with real, and they, those were real ads. And so, oh, really? yes, they were real ads. Huh? Yes. And so, um, you know, I thought just so, and then the story would just be, you'd come from, I'd find, choose an ad, and then I'd write the story. And the garden one was definitely like, I am a gardener. Um, and, you know, I have a close relationship with the land that we're on and the gardens. But I know most people are completely overwhelmed. And even like this whole like leaf blowing thing, you know, and the leaf blowers are just bad for everything. Once again, the insects, it's really killing the insects. They're just like, they're just bad all around, aside from the fact that they're gas powered and loud. And, mm-hmm. and we don't need to be doing that. You know, we are, we want everything so tidy and that isn't how we want to control nature. Well, that's how we got into this problem, you know, is by controlling nature. And we mm-hmm. have got to now let nature have a little bit of lead, you know, to, yeah. um, to, to so it can re- heal itself. And definitely, like, you don't need to, like, get every leaf off your property in the fall. You just don't. It does it like it is better for the land for it to stay. If you're doing lawns, mm-hmm. well, you shouldn't be doing that many lawns. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, use a rake and get them off the lawns and just push them to the side yeah, and then deal changed. with it in the spring. Well, we'll see what happens with that um, yeah. on Cape Ann. Uh, but, yeah. you know, as a Cape Ann resident, um, what are you seeing uh, it, like in your backyard yeah. and on your property mm-hmm. that you think people should be concerned about? You know, are there, are there things that you, like, what do you see for Cape Ann? Yeah. So there's like multiple questions there about, right. you know, what are you seeing and what do you see for us? Um, you know, uh, I see because I, I live in a, a nature preserve. Um, I've seen like huge changes lately having to do because of deer. Okay. So deer, yes, it's, it's a, a wild animal. It's great to have around a couple of them. But in fact, they are totally destroying the landscape they eat all the asters that the monarchs come to, uh, you know, nectar on during their great migration in the fall. Those asters, except for what I keep now fenced in or sprayed, those asters are gone. So there's like, we don't have this apex predator to keep the um, deer, deer, in uh, check. deer in check. So there's like, you know, there's an example of nature off balance. That one is fairly recent um, but for us in East Gloucester. Um, they have chased away the coyotes, uh, and the coyotes were enough of a, they're not an apex predator, but they're a good scavenger that sort of keeps a lot of things in balance. 
And so we're feeling a little bit off balance now. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think, wish everybody would be just more accepting of these animals among us. I mean, because we can't survive without them. I mean, and that has to do even down, once again, back to the insects. We've lost like 80% in sheer poundage, worldwide poundage of insects in the past 10 years. I mean, if we lose our insects, that we are, we're not far behind, you know, that we have to stop this constant mm -hmm. spraying and, you know, blowing their eggs away in the fall. I mean, we are just doing a lot of stupid things. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because that's how we want our world to be is like just us. Mm -hmm. And yet we want to see the animals. So we go to see them, you know, and we want them in our, their you know, neat little package and being cute for us. But that isn't how nature works. And that isn't what cycles are. Mm -hmm. That's just not, you know, it's not good nature. I, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a change of expectations, mm -hmm. right? And an understanding of where, like, the, where we can make a change. Right. For instance, like you were just saying with um, the leaf blowers mm -hmm. and the understanding of what the impacts are. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, Cape Ann is a, the, a vulnerable place, and your book um, has a few stories that are, I guess, based here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that's always uh, fun to see. Um, Kind of as a as a last question for you, mm -hmm. um, what uh, how do you like people to react to your stories? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you what do you hear from yeah. from your audience right now? Yeah, well, you know, it's very um, you just always try never to be preachy. You know, you can't you do that. All you can do is like present images because images is the way towards creating action because it words you know words that create images are art. You know even before words art, creating the images will actually do a whole lot more than reading research papers. That's a silly way to, uh, for the human brain to take in information, but the steps it has to go through to mm -hmm. do that. Whereas if you create images either by words or, uh, you know, other materials, art materials, it goes straight there. And so you have to do this emotional impact to create change. And so that is what I, I always aim to do. Um, that's sometimes maybe why they can be dark because that is an you know emotion. Um, I, so I just really hope that that readers go away, you know, feeling like ah, and um, and just then think, and then just think, you know, like how likely is all this, or is this real? And that's an important thing about getting science right in here. I mean, it's fiction, but it's so important to get the science right because when well, you get one little thing wrong and they're like, oh, you know, that 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 can't happen. But it's it's can happen. It has happened. It's happening now. We are the all the models, all the climate change models are have been greatly accelerated, it's come far sooner than anybody, any scientist had predicted. And so that's even that's pretty scary. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Joanne, we're yeah. going to um, end on that note. Okay. Joanne Hart, okay. author of High Wire Act. Um, thank you so much for joining me on Nature Wins Podcast. Yeah. Um, we're going to be right back. Uh, we're going to take a break, and we're going to hear from our sponsor, uh, Common Crow. And in our second segment, we'll be speaking with the artist, Tim Rodeshia. Thank you. Common Crow Natural Market, Cape Ann's one-stop shop for natural and organic food, scratch-made grab-and-go treats and meals, natural and organic wellness and beauty items, and fair trade gifts and housewares. Kind service and knowledgeable staff will help you make the best choices for you. Our passion feeds you. We're back in the studio uh, here at Nature Winds Podcast at the Streamography Studios in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And um, here with me is Kim Radosha. And Kim is an artist on Cape Ann. We are going to be talking about the intersection of art and nature um, with Kim. So, Kim, give us our audience an overview of the kind of work, the kind of art that you do. Sure. Yeah, I've done um, large outdoor public sculpture um, that has 
basically been in municipalities around the country, traveled around, um, and have done um, everything from that kind of sculpture to more intimate assemblages um, that are sculptural wall reliefs. So I work quite diversely. Um, and I also, more recently, I'm working in a crossover between painting and sculpture. So I'm, I'm sort of all over the place a bit, but I'd say mostly, most, mostly sculpture. Yeah. How'd you get started in your work? Um, I started very young, and um, but more formally, I started in my 20s, actually, after I'd finished college and went back to art school in my mid-20s uh, and studied it in earnest. And um, yeah, so I, I essentially got a couple of degrees. And uh, yeah, from that point on, I, I just went head forward into the world of art. So, Well, you live in West Gloucester. Right. And uh, um, on the Great Marsh. So I wanted to ask you uh, first out about it's a migratory route. It's mm -hmm. the, the Great Marsh. And so there's been a lot of changes in the marsh. And we know that the marsh changes um, every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of uh, like a climate story that the mm -hmm. marsh is telling you, what mm -hmm. what does that look like? Yeah, I think that it's quite um, interesting that over the course of the time I've lived there, probably about 10 years or so, I've noticed quite a difference in the level of high tides. Uh, king tides, the, the, the bigger tides, have been coming up higher and more frequently. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we always get quite a bit of extreme weather on that coast and all around us, basically. But that has been my one takeaway. We have a, a, a walkway that kind of goes out to the marsh. And that walkway, when we first came in, used to never be covered with water, and now it's starting to, the water is covering that walkway more and more. So that's that's a direct sort of response that I've noticed in the last 10 years. Yeah. What is that, how does that feel? Like, what does that mean to you? Um, it just feels like everything that we know about what's happening with the climate is happening, and we're, we're witnessing it. So it's, you know, I think a lot of people have felt that change might be coming more gradually. I really feel that that change is now. So it, it feels like an urgency to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about, um, you know, there's so much wildlife out on the marsh. Mm. Um, are you seeing uh, a drop in biodiversity or, mm. or what you used to observe? Mm. Or is, are there changes that you can clearly see? It's harder to notice that kind of change. Um, I can, w I witness quite a lot of, um, bird activity. Um, what I could say, perhaps, in relation to being there for 10 years is that it's just becoming more and more important that we have places for birds to rest and feed. And instead of having one type of bird passing through and landing on the property, we've got multiple flocks of many types of birds. Like this week, particularly, we had um, starlings and robins together. And they come by the hundreds, so it's, it's not like you're just getting a few birds. So um, and when they come, they're looking for food. So they come and they land and they just scavenge at every last berry on every tree, every <laughs> last berry on every juniper. Um, and so it, it, that's becoming interesting to watch. Yeah. So the importance of maintaining um, a you know, particular habitat for these birds. Yes. Um, and, and I was, you know, with, with rising uh, tides, mm -hmm. um, do you think that that would impact you know, those, the, mm. that habitat, are you, is that something that you I see I think happening? it will. Um, it's a little bit more gradual, I would imagine. But, um, you know, water isn't a bad thing for these birds in some ways. You know, that having fresh, a lot of fresh water is good for them. Um, but I do think that with water is runoff and also, you know, the impact of runoff into our creeks and the streams and, and the ocean. So that that will obviously affect the birds and the fish. Um, so that is very much a factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your art has mm -hmm. been deeply influenced um, by nature, mm -hmm. and uh, and and you've come to this approach through you know, your study of nature, the patterns of nature, movement mm -hmm. in nature. And we're going to mm -hmm. show some pictures um, and some visuals of of your work uh, mm -hmm. for those who are watching the video. You'll be able to see them, but. I hope that you'll describe it a little bit more. Um, you know, what's running right now in the video is um, a series of works that, that you've shared with us. 
that really do show this kind of movement. Could you describe some of what we're seeing here? Sure. Yeah. The um, relief that you're seeing on looks like um, many, many pieces of um, paper moving together. That is a, a technique that I developed more recently in the last 10 years. Um, I work, I've work. i been working with paper my entire life, but the connection to nature is a result of my studying nature really intensely and being a part of the nature. Um, so patterns and, and movement, and that everything's moving all around us in nature. So I'm trying to evoke that movement in the work, um, and um, the relief is, um, the wall relief is, is time consuming yet meditative. Um, oftentimes, I will have um, a full drawing on my panel of what I'm going to do, and I'm looking, I'm looking at things outside of my view, and you know, in my area as well as you know, patterns of birds, water lines, um, the patterns of uh, rock formations, and things like that. So I'm always sort of looking at these things and dissecting them a bit, and. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm of the belief that, you know, as, um, you know, the artists, when, when they're working on climate issues or nature issues, that when you come to see art, there's something that happens to you. There's a, mm. there's a transfer of emotion mm -hmm. um, when viewing it. And it's, sometimes it's the first time people, um, um, you know, like encounter Mm -hmm, uh, that mm -hmm. kind of a feeling. Mm -hmm. Do you find that people are reacting to your work like that? Or, or tell me a little bit more about what you hear. Yeah, I think that um, my work is so physical. There's so much to it in terms of quantity. Like when people go to it, they don't quite know what they're seeing. So I think there's this confusion as to what is that, first of all, which catches their attention and catches their curiosity. And then when they study it and come closer, they realize what it is. And I think that that is, it's this discovery, like you're saying, and it's this sort of um, awakening. And it's its really, for me, that's, a, that's the funnest part about what I'm doing. And then also they start to recognize that there's so much change within the piece itself that when you move by it or move through it um, or back up from it or move closer, everything is always changing. So... In the sentence, they're becoming kinetic, but the viewer is making them kinetic. So it's it's um it's really giving them the opportunity to participate in the piece, and then that's really the joy of what I'm doing is giving them that mm -hmm. that experience. So yeah, thanks, Kim. Yeah. I mean, we can stop the the um, photo um, reel. I I wanted to go and talk about have you explain the your um your installation piece at the Cape Inn Museum and you know, what what were you doing? What were you requested to do and sure. how did that all pan yeah. out? Yeah, I was requested to um work with the idea of a haystack, um the haystacks of of our past in history and um when when hay was being harvested for animal feed. Um and I basically looked to the paintings of the Cape Inn Museum. They gave me um you know, view of, of um, some of the paintings that have the haystack motifs in them, in the landscapes. So what I decided to do was to um, make a mock haystack rather than a, an actual filled haystack, because I could have easily probably just stacked up a bunch of hay. But I sort of thought, okay, here's an opportunity to expand, expand that historical icon um, which was probably incredibly beautiful to look at at the time. We don't have very many left in our landscapes. but um, So I, I basically built a shell-like haystack that you could enter. So it's a space that was sort of cut into two halves that you could walk into and then um, decided to have a native plant um, advocacy project within the haystack. So I had educational materials, and I also had... Um, the opportunity for people coming through to pledge um, by by hanging a stick within the haystack, um, a cutoff of a piece of um, wood, you know, wood or or stick, uh, and pledge to plant native plants. So within the haystack, I also had native plants for the people to take away and and bring home. So if they made the pledge, they took a plant and um, put them into the ground. That was the hope. So with that. that Came sort of a crossover of sculpture, where sculpture can bridge the gap between science and um, and climate and art. 
So I, I enjoyed that project immensely. And that sort of launched me into some other things as well. So let's talk about um, Blackburn Circle. Mm, yes. Tell me about how that started. I mean, was it COVID? Um, inspiration uh, project and yeah um, that was a COVID well I had always wanted to do something there and I'm sure many people have because it's just sort of the space that's kind of vacant yeah, yeah. Um, but I know the history that that wasn't always the case um, that there was it was wooded at one time but um, during COVID you know we all had so much time and I, I just decided that I was going to go ahead and, and try to um, work with the Mass Department of Transportation to to make something of that space. So I went through the process of adopting that rotary which is actually quite large it's almost three acres basically um, and worked with them on a plan which would be to develop a native uh, man, a native meadow within within the Blackburn Circle. Yeah. And and you had um, some volunteers who worked with you. I How sure did that did. come about? Yeah, so, um, you know, it was interesting because I think co with COVID, I think a lot of people <laughs> were sort of thinking about these things. And um, the native plant movement really had gained a lot of momentum through that time. And um, there were people moving back to the area from other areas. And so... Um, I was able to uh, link up with some local gardeners as well as um, very knowledgeable people who wanted to do something in the community. So we we got together and started our first planting. Um, I think it was um, in the fall of 2021, um, and uh, that was the the initial, you know, plant out into into Blackburn and volunteers and things like that. Yeah. So when you're coming under Blackburn or, yeah. you know, entering the, the rotary the yeah. there, um, what, what are, what are people looking at? Well, essentially you're just going to see a lot of like tall grassish in the middle. Basically they've, uh, they've, uh, stopped mowing a circle within the center of Blackburn circle. And I don't want anybody to work, look too closely because it's dangerous. You know, we want to, Keep our eyes on the road, but yeah. um, I was envisioning just having a space where, where, um, ha where there could be a habitat where you know birds and insects could rest and have some nutrition, and to improve the space by having some native plants, which are kind of hard to come by. They're in our crevasses of our properties, and they grow mm -hmm. through cracks of sidewalks, and they actually are really hardy, and they're all they're around us, but. Um, many people don't recognize their value. So that was sort of the idea was to um, build out this circle in the middle and then slowly over time expand that circle further and further. So oh, great. So yeah. we might see it move. It move should outward. be able to move outward because basically all the plants that were used, we used plants that we had on our own properties and took them to the site. So we, we you know, put in uh, rhizome plugs, which about close to probably 2,000. Plus, we've done some seeding as well. So it's it's been a lot of hard work, but very doable work too and very satisfying mm -hmm. work. And um, it's a tricky site. There's no water up there. We really have been battling with, um, you know, just the basics of that site, which is a lot of, there's a lot of fill. And then there's just turf, like seven inches of turf um, over the fill. Mm -hmm. So but it's amazing what's happened already. So, well, yeah. we're looking forward to that. You yeah, know, to that beauty. Uh, yeah, at Blackburn Circle. I think next year will be the year. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> um, well, this this work at Blackburn Circle led you to Burnham's Field. So, yes. tell me more about what you're doing there because sure. it seems like a step from you know the Cape Ann Museum to Blackburn Circle to now this other work that you're doing to mm -hmm. have it more interactive. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm always thinking about ways to you know bring it to the public. So, um, you know, the, there's no way people can go to Blackburn Circle. It's just not possible. Right. So, uh, so we've been looking for a space that would, that would be conducive to have the public come and have workshops and do some seed sharing and sharing plants. So we got permission last, um, end of last winter to do uh, Burnham's Field in collaboration with backyard growers near their growing gardens. So we're working closely right mm -hmm. next to them and um, the city, the DPW, and um, that's our first start. We just started planting that this last spring, and it's quite abundant and really thriving. 
So it's been really fun to watch that because that was a situation where we had some control. We could actually water. We had access to, you know, some water. So, but we had such a rainy summer, we barely <laughs> needed to water. So anyway, but that was, our idea was to have that be an educational meadow, essentially, for, for the native plants so we could share it with the community. So people can come down to Burnham Field and they could um, take a look at a native plant garden um, mm -hmm. and uh, and also be able to identify the plants mm -hmm. and the beneficial plants that they might have in their yard. It's not mm -hmm. a weed. Right. Um, and uh, I would like to talk, have you talk about the foraging piece because I just found that, <laughs> I just found it wonderful when, when uh, you were telling me about that. Um, what about foraging for, yeah. for native plants? Well, what we, does that look like? We forage on our, on our own properties, but we also forage in other other parts of the city in the area. Um, and one of our, my cohorts, uh, Nick Anderson, is a, he's a genius at, at foraging. But we, we actually have found really incredible asters in the lots behind Market Basket. And, um, you know, we're just always looking for those spots where, you know, it's been left alone because oftentimes nature will take, it will do what nature does. It just, it does its thing and it, it does, does good things. So when you leave it alone, it, it will do good things. And so <clears throat> we've been finding plants that way. Um, and it's just a lot of fun because every once in a while, we'll, like for instance, we, um, we did a yarrow bomb up at Blackburn. So we found yarrow though within Blackburn Circle. So we didn't have to go very far, but there's, there's yarrow all within the, the turf. So we just mm -hmm. literally probably, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yarrow plants, you just, you just get them out with a um, soil knife and then you're just transplanting them wherever you need mm -hmm. to transplant them. And they don't take, they don't, it doesn't take a lot of effort and they don't need a lot of love, which is lucky. Important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're just really hardy. And um, yeah, it's incredible how, how resilient they are. Yeah. Uh, well, well, we're talking about what, what people can do in foraging. Mm -hmm. um, why is it important that people plant a native garden in their yard? You know, they could um, take part of their lawn. They could, this is a movement that's happening right now, mm -hmm. um, making your lawn into uh, a native a native garden. So what, how can people take action on that? Yeah, I think that people, um, it's important to learn the plants. I mean, it really, you know, you have to start to recognize what's what, essentially. And a lot, there's a lot of people in this area that are very knowledgeable. So there's so many gardeners that already know so much about this. The other part that's difficult a little bit more is to actually get those plants. Like you can't necessarily always go out and buy these at a nursery or at a um, garden center. And what kind of plants are we talking about? We're talking about um, things like blue lobelia. It's not something you would normally see at a garden center. Blue lobelia is a native plant that um, is beautiful, but just don't see it anymore. And it's also not necessarily a plant that would be growing um, on the side of the highway, like a, like a um, goldenrod or something like that. Goldenrod is prolific and aggressive, so it's all around us. But so that's that's an example. But um, you know, there are other native plants. Once you just once you learn to recognize some of these things, you start to notice, oh, okay, I didn't cut my grass, and look what's coming up over there, and that's a native plant. Like it's actually in the seed bed. It's underneath, and it's gonna if you give it a chance, it'll it'll come up. Mm -hmm. So some things have come up in my, I have bush clover in my property, which I didn't even know what it was. It's also a native plant that you just don't see anymore and you can't buy it. But I just didn't, I stopped mowing and mm -hmm. it came up. So the birds are dropping these seeds as well. And so they're coming in that way. Um, but foraging is, um, you just have to start to be, pay attention to the plants in your yard and your spaces. And um, we're hoping to be able to share native plants through our through these meadows, uh, using them essentially as little nurseries so that we can then, you know, give these plants to others mm -hmm. free of charge. So, And, and you're using um, like a, a closed loop system yes. uh, so that you're sharing the plants. There's no transaction involved and you're keeping it local. So exactly. Um, and how yeah. did, uh, was that all part of the mix when you started thinking about this? Well, I think it was. And I think we decided as a group that that was 
becoming more and more important and to emphasize that more and more. So um, we intentionally started out that way. Um, you know, we live in a very commercial world where there's a lot of exchange of money, but we felt strongly that in order for um, in order for this to work, it had to be communal and it had to be accessible to everybody, like financially. So it's just, you know, not everybody can afford to buy plants. It's just the way it is. So um, we wanted to give everybody the opportunity to be able to work with this, with this plant material. So that was the idea behind building up these pocket meadows and nurseries, and we're hoping to expand on that. Uh, it's an exciting project. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is an ongoing project, so, yes. you know, uh, yeah. there's, there's, um, there's movement um, with that. But what's, what's next for you? Well, we'd like to um, continue our work at Blackburn, of course, and expand that. And then um, as well as the Burnham's Field Meadow, we have only really completed half of that space. So we will complete that probably next spring. And then we'll probably begin some workshops next summer in that, in that particular space mm -hmm. and would like to expand into other locations. So we've, uh, we're hoping for a couple new spaces and uh, we'll work towards that for next year. How can people find out about those workshops? Is it with um, Backyard Growers or do you have a website? For that particular um, space at Burnham's Field, we, we are working with Backyard Growers. So uh, most of the education has gone th out through their portal. Mm -hmm. um, we have not developed a website at this point. We're mo moving very, very slowly and organically, and we have a very small group, and not a lot of a lot of money to and time to spend on that kind of thing. So right now we're kind of consciously slowing down and moving very organically yeah um and kim where can people see your art are, are you in galleries or do you have pieces around yeah i do actually um i have work at matthew swift gallery on main street and uh i just had a show at the manship artists residency recently in a sculpt in a sculpture show they had this fall so my work is around and uh and it's also out there so it's kind of a combination but yeah and i have a studio and, um, you know, if anyone would like to come and, and see my work, I'm more than happy to have visitors. Um, so they can contact yeah. you through they your website. They can contact me. Yes, yeah. that would be great. That's yeah. great. Well, Kim, thank you so much for being thank on you. Nature Wins Podcast. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Loved it. Thank you. Um, many thanks to my guests, Joanne Hart and Kim Radosha. And for more information on Kim and Joanne, you can see the resources that are included on um, Spotify, as well as on the Town Green website. That's towngreen2025.org. Um, Nature Winds thanks Common Crow, our sponsor, and we thank you also for listening. Thanks for joining us.